So we're going to talk about this normal distribution. It's really a cool distribution. It's so very useful. And um, I need to explain some of the properties of it. And then we can just take it and run and learn about all the kind of probability theories we can apply to it and inferential statistics that can come from it. So this is a picture of the normal distribution. It actually has a formula. That's what it looks like. I don't normally share it with students because it's a little intimidating. But I wanted you to see that it actually is a shape that has definition and it's a geometric shape just like other things so the normal curve is a geometric shape it's defined by two pieces of information the mean and the standard deviation so if you look at this formula there's really just the mean and the standard deviation are what define what it looks like all the other things in here are um, constants or other computations but the really the only two things that vary in this whole formula are the mean and the standard deviation the mean tells you where on the scale you plunk the distribution, and the standard deviation tells you how fat or skinny to make it. And that's really all that we need to define that normal distribution. Otherwise, it just has this shape. So like a rectangle can be defined by height and width, or a circle can be defined by the radius. The normal distribution is defined by the mean and the standard deviation. You'll often hear it be called the theoretical bell-shaped curve. Books often cite that and um, other websites you might go to. So I wanted to mention that's what they call it. I won't be calling it a bell-shaped curve. That phrase was kind of coined by a man who wrote a book that had very racist thoughts, and I don't want to give him any credit. So yes, I recognize it looks like a bell. Enough said. I'm going to call it a normal curve. So this normal curve is unimodal, symmetric, and asymptotic. So unimodal means that well, we just learned about the mode, right? We, the mode is the most common response. And una means one. So this means that the normal curve has one mode. And that's the peak of the distribution here. We know it is symmetric. So symmetric means that it can be folded in half and it's the same on either side, like a butterfly. So if we put a line down the middle here, we would see that the left side of the distribution looks just like the right side of the distribution. And it is asymptotic. Asymptotic means it's never ending. So notice how we have this dis distribution here with these arrows kind of going off into negative infinity and then often here going into infinity. Oftentimes you'll see us when we're talking about normal distributions, we'll draw it as if they have endpoints. But really, in theory, normal distributions never end. They go off into negative infinity and positive infinity. So just keep that in mind that every score is possible because these uh, lines go off into never never land so in theory most behavioral measures tend to follow a normal curve that's what's so amazing about the normal distribution is that many things naturally follow in a normal distribution which means that all of the stuff that we're going to learn about it and and applying probabilities to it we can now apply to these other behavioral measures and even things that don't follow a normal curve sometimes we can um, make them follow a normal curve so like the iq test the first iteration of the iq test was not normally distributed and so they tweaked it and changed the questions to make it normally distributed and again that might feel like it's cheating but the purpose of it is that once we can have something normally distributed, we now know so much about that distribution, and we now know the likelihood of falling in different areas in that distribution, and that's really a big piece of what statistics is about, is making guesses and um, understanding the likelihood of being in certain areas. So, you know, if we look at even natural things like flower pattern growth or children's um, uh, how far they wander from parents when they're at the park. A lot of these things follow a normal distribution anyway. So it's a pretty cool distribution. And the last piece that's kind of a property of it is that the mean, median, and mode are all at the same spot and they're right in the middle. So this would be the mode because it's the peak of the distribution. This would be the median because 50% are on the left and 50% are on the right. And then this would also be the mean because it's the mathematical center of the distribution. So that's super cool that they're all in the same spot. So when we look at this distribution, what we're really wanting to get at is likelihoods. What is the likelihood that you're going to have a score here? Or if I know your score, what's the chances that's, um, that somebody else is going to have a score just like that? And so calculus is what's going to really give us the probabilities of this normal distribution. And they looked at areas under the curve and calculated um, kind of the, the likelihood of falling there. And so um, I'm going to shift gears a little bit 
and go to a different screen where I can mess around with it and kind of draw for you. So if we're looking at a normal distribution and we set the mean to be in the middle, so I'll just, this is my attempt to draw a mu. <laughs> if I go up one standard deviation, calculus majors have told me that 34 percent of people fall between the mu and the one standard deviation above the mean. That's pretty cool. You might be thinking, how did calculus majors know that? Remember when you had to learn about calculating the area of a rectangle and you had to do base times height? So that's what calculus majors are doing. But you'll notice that in this rectangle here, there's a little bit of a curved area. So they, calculus majors have to do integrals to figure out the area under a curved zone. So if you've taken calculus, this should be triggering some uh, memories of integrals. And what they were doing was just calculating areas under a curve. Calculating those areas gives you the likelihood of being in that area. So we're just going to trust those calculus majors that they knew what they were doing when they tell us that 34% um, of people fall between the mean and one standard deviation above the mean. Well, since this is a symmetrical distribution, we now know that if we go down one standard deviation, this is also 34% percent of the population. Now notice that I don't have a negative percent because this is the count of people. This is a percentage of people. Um, you can go scores below the mean, which makes negative z-scores, but I still am going to have a positive count of people. You can't have negative people. That'd be like ghosts or something. I don't know. So we don't have negative people, but we have a positive percentage. Well, because calculus majors have told us that it's roughly 34% of one standard deviation above the mean and 34% for one standard deviation below the mean, I now know that this middle area is 68% of the distribution, which is pretty cool. I now know where most people are. I know where more than half the people will fall. Here's what calculus majors did for us that's even better, is they said, hey, if you go out another standard deviation, so if you go out two, oh, my handwriting is terrible, two standard deviations, they said that we looked it up, and the integral for this said that this was 14% of the distribution, and this piece was 2% of the distribution. So as with the other side, if I go down, and because it's symmetrical, it's going to be the same numbers. So this piece here is 14% and 2%. I apologize. Okay, that's the last time I'm going to say sorry for my handwriting. You get it. All right. So notice, these numbers all add up to 100. So 34 plus 14 plus 2, that's 50%. This means that 50% goes from the middle all the way to the end, and 50% goes from this middle line all the way to this end. And we can now start talking about your likelihood of falling in these different areas based on knowing what your z-score is or how many standard deviations you are above and below the mean. So let's do some examples to kind of really explore what this looks like. Okay, so let's just make some fake data. And, um, and actually, this is kind of a fun one. Let's talk about how fast people drive on the freeway. Now. I'm not talking about how fast people should drive on the freeway. Let's talk about how fast people really drive on the freeway. And again, that's kind of the purpose of psychology is we're, we're not really looking at what is right and wrong. We're looking at what people do. So if I look at the average speed on the freeway, I would guess it's 75 miles per hour. So let's pretend I collected data and I found that most people, uh, the mean uh, speed on the freeway was 75 miles per hour. And then let's say that the standard deviation for this population was 10. So what's one standard deviation above the mean for this particular story? So the average speed was 75. One standard deviation above the mean would be 85. So we take that standard deviation and we add it to the mean. Since we're in this pattern already, let's just go one more up. What's one more standard deviation above the mean? We take that 10 and we add it to the 85, so we now we have 95. Well, let's go down the other way, too. So if um, we take 75 as the mean and we want to go down one standard deviation, that number would be 65, and this number would be 55. If you're not sure where I'm getting those numbers, you need to make sure to reach out to me because this is a really important piece of understanding this distribution. We set the mean to be in the middle. That's my symbol for the mu. It looks kind of like a backwards four. <laughs> And then we go up in increments of the standard deviation. 
And so if I were to try and translate this into z-scores, I could think of this on a separate line. Remember, we say z-scores are going to set the mean to be 0, and we're going to set the standard deviation to be 1. So this would be a z-score of 1. This would be a z-score of 2. This would be a z-score of negative 1. And this would be a z-score of negative 2. So if you tell me I drive 85 miles per hour on the freeway, I would say, oh, you have a z-score of 1. And then let's say that we're trying to figure out um, the likelihood of people going faster than you. So because of calculus majors, I know that this is 34%, this is 14%, and this little baby area is 2, and this is 34, 14, 2. So I always think it's just easier to remember 34, 14, 2, 34, 14, 2. Um, if you can remember those numbers, then it's as easy to plug in. So if I were to ask you, um, hey, you, uh, how fast do you go? And you say 85 miles per hour. And we wanted to figure out how many people go above, oops, let me just get the right color here. How many people go above 85 miles per hour? Let's see if we can figure that out. When we're looking at this picture, really that area would be associated with, here's the 85 miles an hour, and we want to know what all this area is here. Because the area under the curve is the likelihood of being in it. So I can see there's a 14 and a 2, so I would know that roughly 16% of people are going to go faster than you. Can you guess um, how many people would go slower than you? So if I were to draw that, if I want to say how many people go slower than you, if you go 85 miles an hour, that would look like this. That would be, here's the 85, that would be all of this. Now let's talk about how I can calculate that area. Maybe uh, you can pause the video for a second and see if you can do the calculation, and then let's see what, if you did what I did. All right, so there's several ways we could do this. We could do the 34 plus the 34 plus the 14 plus the 2, right? We could add all those up. We could have said 100 minus 16, right? Because we know that we already calculated the 16, so we're subtracting that from 100. Or the other thing we could have done is I recognize that, let me just put it in a different color so we can see it, that this line here is the 50% mark. So this over here is 50%. If that's 50%, then my question is really just about this 34 piece added to that. So another thing you could have done is said 50 plus 34. Uh, all of those things will give the answer of 84%. So 84% of people um, go slower than you. So this is super messy, but what you can see is that I now knowing the mean and the standard deviation, I now know a lot. I know where most the most people are going between 65 and 85 miles per hour. That specifically 68% of people are going between 65 and 85 miles per hour. I know that if someone drives 85 miles per hour, that 16% of people travel faster than them. That I know 84% of people go slower than them. And so this has given us kind of a wealth of information um, to go for. So let's see if we can do some more calculations. So if we start over and kind of reset our picture so we can kind of get our bearings here, let's remind ourselves that the average speed was 75 and we went up in increments of 10. So we have 75, 85, and 95, and then we have 65 and 55. Okay, my handwriting is getting messier as we go. <laughs> so if we're looking at this picture, let's say that my question for you is, what percent of people traveled between 65 and 85 miles per hour? Now, because calculus majors have um, kind of broken down these pieces for us, and we now know that there's 34, 4%, 14, 2. Remember just to write in 34, 14, 2. It'll always help you out. We can figure out pretty easily the area that I'm looking for is this piece here. 34 plus 34 is 68%. See how fun that was. Now we can um, ask a different question. We can um, do something that's maybe a little harder. Let's see if I can just clean up my screen here. What if I wanted to ask the question of how many people were um, between, let's say, 
65 and 95. So you'll have to think this it, a little bit differently. We have our 34, 14, oops, 2. So we want to know the area between this six score and this score. So it's kind of a simple addition. We'll see what you came up with. We have 34 plus 34 plus 14. So that's going to be 68 plus 14. Oh, I can't do simple math. 34, 34, 14, 82. 82% of people travel between 65 and 95 miles per hour. So you see how this 34, 14, 2 element is really helpful. The problem becomes, what happens if my question had been, I'll put it in blue, how many people go above 80 miles per hour? So above 80 miles per hour is right in here all the way to the end of the distribution. That's a little bit more difficult to do because our calculus majors haven't told us if we land at the 80, what would happen. They only put, told us the scores for the landmarks on, on the standard deviation area. So we have the, the mean, and then we have the each landing zone of the primary standard deviations. So if we're outside that scope, if we're not landing right on a standard deviation of one or two or negative one or negative two, our 34, 14, two won't be able to tell us. And so then we're gonna end up using the table that calculus majors have generated for us so that we can answer all the questions about all the scores in between. So in our next video, we're gonna learn how to read the table and answer lots of questions so we can figure out exactly what the percentage of scores uh, or, or p drivers that go above 80 miles per hour. If I ask you this question too, I want you to start thinking generally what kind of number you're expecting. We know it's gonna include a two, a 14, and then partial of the 34%. So you wanna start thinking if you can guess roughly what percentage are above 80. But we're gonna end up using our, um, our normal distribution table to really give us the exact numbers of the percent of people who travel more than 80 miles per hour um, because calculus majors have done all the math for us.